country of Switzerland in the heart of Europe, I extend greetings to all of you. While I was looking forward to being physically present in North Carolina, I am yet grateful that we are still able to connect with each other virtually. It is really my hope that you and your families are all well as we continue to wade through the coronavirus pandemic of uncertainty, frustration, and misfortune. Last spring, I welcomed warmly and humbly the invitation extended to me to be one of the keynote speakers of the Renaldo Conference entitled Becoming American, Moravians and Their Neighbors, 1772 to 1822. I'm really, really very thankful to the organizers for this honor and privilege. But I wish to express my gratitude to Ulrike, who was ever so kind and gracious in her ongoing communications with me. I felt like we became colleagues and friends, even though we have not met yet physically. I'm also grateful and really, really indebted to Thomas McAuliffe from the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem, who assisted me greatly in sourcing much of the records I've used in my research. My presentation is on the topic, Black People, White God, Moravianism, and the cultural purification of the Afro-Caribbean in Antigua and Tobago. Now, this topic was conceived well before the recent months of national and global protests, the recent months of private and public discussions, individual and institutional reflections, and the philosophical and ideological shifts associated with the Black Lives Movement today. Now, in this more attentive and sensitive climate, I hope that this presentation will be an added voice to the difficult but necessary conversations on racial issues and the Christian faith. This and all of my research as a historian has been filtered through my personal journey as a black woman from the Caribbean. Therefore, I search for more than the accuracy of dates. I search for more than significant names. I search for more than comparative figures. And I search for more than epoch-making events. I search for meaning, understanding, and connectivity. Now, the reality of my ancestral history as a black woman is that of capture, dislocation, enslavement, manipulation, abandonment, and exclusion. I heard this in the stories from my great-grandmother, Lydia Licorice, who told me of her daily struggles to create a way of life as the grandchild of an enslaved African. On the other hand, the narrative of my ecclesiastical history as a lifelong Moravian is that of sacrifice, service, education, compassion, and development. From a child, I was taught this through the heroic stories of the missionaries. Though impoverished, we are told, though they became sick, and even in the face of death, they crossed the Atlantic and remained in the Caribbean to preach a gospel of redemption and hope. This ancestral and ecclesiastical encounter has made for an intriguing chapter in the history of the Caribbean and the history of the Moravian Church. The latter history has been written and recorded through the eyes of the missionaries primarily. Research on the stories on the black population in the Caribbean have fitted very well into the wider Moravian mission history narrative. But there yet remains many unanswered questions. When the people have been uprooted from their place of birth, estranged from ethnic and tribal groups, 
separated from biological families, how might they perceive a Christian mission that endeavored to strip them away from the one thing that connected them together, the African culture? Were they saved enough? Were they ever good enough? Or were they even happy enough? This paper examines the work of the Moravian missions in the context of two Caribbean islands, Antigua and Tobago. It provides a backdrop to the black people for whom the fate of history has made the Caribbean their home. This paper submits that the colonists and their churches imposed the European God on the colonies, but it was the evangelicals, beginning with the Moravians, who introduced this God to the black population. And finally, this paper contains that the distinctiveness of Moravianism was effective in reaching, shaping, and equipping the black population because the Moravians believe that the African culture was an inherent evil, they denounced and attempted to purge the very essence of who the black people are. In this paper, black people is defined as the class of people of African ancestry. In the Caribbean, this characterizes the enslaved Africans and their descendants. It includes the African-born, initially called Africans, and the locally-born Africans, usually described as Creole. Black people in this paper also includes the mixed races known as colored or mulatto. In more recent years, Afro-Caribbean has been the term broadly speaking of black people in the Caribbean. Colonists were the European settlers who inhabited the Caribbean. These were the owners and managers of the sugar estates and the other properties. These were the administrators, the professionals, and the persons of authority who dictated the way of life. These are to be distinguished from the colonialists who supported the presence of the Europeans in the Caribbean but never lived in the Caribbean. The colonists are also to be distinguished from the poor whites who were brought to the Caribbean from the mid 1600s to be laborers, but they had no power. In this paper, white God is the ideological and theological image of the Eurocentric God of Christianity. This God, framed in the process of colonization and evangelization in the Caribbean context, stood for Christian and European values. It was only in the early 20th century that black people in the Caribbean identified the whiteness of God as a principal cause for black self-negation and an obstruction to black self-determination. The Caribbean, in this paper, is an archipelago that is geographically located south of North America, east of Central America, north of South America, and west of the African continent. It currently comprises 27 independent countries several territories and hundreds of islands. Today, the Caribbean is one of the most pop popular destinations boasting on much natural beauty. My presentation will continue under three headings. Black people in Antigua and Tobago, the white god of colonialism and evangelization, Moravianism and culture purification. Black people in Antigua and Tobago. The identification of the biblical land of Kush or Ethiopia as the land of burnt or black-faced people has held both historic and missional significance for Africans and people of African descent. Significantly, 
It connected Judeo-Christianity with black people before the modern era of European missions. It underscored the divine destiny of the black race, and it has affirmed the authenticity of blackness in recent times. It was Timothy Welch who has insightfully argued in his work, The Roots of the Color of Christianity, that Christianity was initially a religion of brown and black people before it spread among the white populations. Using biblical narratives, Wells traced the presence of Christianity on the African continent before the missional activity of the early church and the eventual acceptance of the Christian religion in Europe. By the Middle Ages, Europe was broadly synonymous with Christendom. It was in the 15th century, Europe extended its political and religious powers into Africa. This peaked in the 19th century with a period known as colonialism, Christianity, and commerce. Accordingly, there was some Christian influence in West Africa before and during the Atlantic slave trade. The Africans who were transported to the British colonies or to the Caribbean would have had Christian influence, but they were not likely Christian. British colonization. Both Antigua and Tobago are part of the group of islands defined as the Lesser Antilles. Antigua, a small island of 108 square miles, is part of the Leeward Islands, while Tobago, an equally sized island of 114 square miles, is in the southern part of the Caribbean. Antigua and Tobago are part of the twin island states, Antigua and Barbuda, Trinidad and Tobago. Antigua was visited by Christopher Columbus in 1493, and Tobago was sighted by him in 1498. The islands were occupied for centuries by indigenous populations, but it was the Caribs, also known as Kalinagos, that were met by the Europeans. Known for their fierce protection of their lands, the presence of the Kalinagos was believed to have attributed to the delay of colonization in Antigua, and even more so in Tobago, as we shall see. Antigua was eventually colonized in 1632, in the first phase of the British colonization in the colonies. Except for eight months occupation of the French, Antigua remained a British colony. With its sister island Barbuda, Antigua gained independence in 1981. Antigua was part of the golden age of the sugar economy. Now, beginning from 1614, Tobago has a unique history of changing hands 33 times between colonial powers. The Calanagos in Tobago, as alluded to earlier, did not only keep out the Spanish colonists during the first century, but they battled with the other European colonists for another century. Tobago was claimed by the British through European treaties in 1763, in the second phase of British colonization. However, between 1781 and 1793, there was French occupancy, and again in 1802, the French seized the island. Eventually, it was in 1814, after 300 years without a colonizer, that Tobago was confirmed as a British colony. Tobago was in the civil age of the sugar economy at the height of economic prosperity. Along with Trinidad, Tobago gained its independence from Britain in 1962. So in summary, Antigua experienced three and a half centuries of British colonization. After a century of multiple European settlement, desertion, and resettlement, the British colonized Tobago for a century and a half. So let's talk now about the Africans. 
Between 1662 and 1807, which marked the beginning and ending of the slave trade, 3.1 million Africans were traded and enslaved in the British-owned colonies in the Caribbean. Higman has pointed out that before the abolition of the slave trade, Africans were brought in primarily from Windward Coast, Gold Coast, and Bight of Benin. During this period, there was a constant recruitment of Africans, but they remained a threat to the extinction of the black population due to the lack of natural increase. In Antigua and Tobago, the Africans quickly outgrew the white populations in the Caribbean. Black and whites in the Caribbean in the mid-1770s, as this chart will show, will see that there is a difference in ratio between the blacks and the whites in Antigua as well as in Tobago. In Antigua, it represents a ratio of 8% and in Tobago, 19%. By the 19th century, there was the dominance of Africans from Bight of Biafra and Central Africa. Higman noted that in the Southern Caribbean, which included Tobago, most of the enslaved were from the Bight of Biafra, but in the Leeua Islands, which includes Antigua, the enslaved originated from Central Africa and Senegambia. So we will see the African populations in Antigua and Tobago. In his research on the Western origins of the Africans in the Caribbean, Nathaniel identified Yoruba, Fan Iwe, Fantai Ashantai, and Congo as the main ethnic groups. Yoruba, the largest in the southern region of Africa, bore close relations to the Igbo-speaking peoples. The Aiken peoples were from the western section of Africa, are ah, the Ashanti peoples as well. The Fon Iwe, primarily of Benin, were not as much known as the Congo in Central Africa. Ethnic historians have done extensive research in identifying the African ethnicities by body mutilation of either country marks or foul teeth. Missionaries, including the Moravians, provided details of descriptions of the Africans. While there were generally diverse ethnic and tribal backgrounds in the Caribbean, Higmo have found that Congo and the Igbo or Yoruba were the two most important groups from both Central Africa and the Bight of Biafra. According to the analysis of Higman, by the 19th century, there was a changing mix of ethnic groups in Antigua. However, Tobago had particular source regions. The African ethnic composition in Tobago was more likely to be heterogeneous. When the Moravians began mission in Antigua and Tobago in 1756 and 1787, respectively, there were four important things of note. Antigua had been colonized by the British for 124 years and Tobago 24 years. The percentage of the black population had outgrown the white settlers. The black population in Antigua had been more locally born or Creole. The black population in Tobago was African born and from specific regions. In both islands, there was a thriving sugar economy that was dependent upon the labor of the black population. Ultimately, British colonialism dominated the socio-economic and religious landscape in Antigua and Tobago. As on the African continent, the dictates of the Christian faith validated the work of the colonists and inspired the mission of the evangelists. 
the white guard of colonialism and evangelicalism. Brian Stanley has correlated the expansion of Christianity in the global South with the commercial and territorial extension of the European colonial empires or colonialism. Although Stanley concluded that the term colonialism is not easily defined, he described it as a form of imperialism in which an alien power imposed former control on a subject territory, making it into a colony governed by the imperial power. Colonialism and Christianity has historically been a marriage of convenience. The peculiarity of colonialism in the Caribbean was that it began with expansion and subjugation, annihilation of an indigenous population under the disguise of Christianity. The Europeans, beginning with the Spanish, assumed that the first Caribbean people were godless and the lands were nameless. To demonstrate their authority over the lands and the peoples, the Europeans adopted two rituals upon their arrival. They planted their flags as well as the cross. With the planting of the flag, the civilization of the nation was imposed and the planting of the cross, the Europeans, according to Cartwright Davis, set their God to work in the Caribbean. The black people were described as chattels and as such would benefit little, if at all, from European Christianity. Essentially, for over a century in the Caribbean, Christianity was betrothed to colonialism insofar as it catered to the needs of the colonists. But with the presence of the colonists, the new colonies became Christian and an extension of European Christendom. The Christian God of the Europeans became the God of the black population. In the lecture, Imaging God in a Caribbean Context, I sketched a portrait of the personal, biblical, contextual, and transitioning image of God in the Caribbean. I've noted in that presentation that this God could have been described as accommodating, distant, perfect, Massa, liberating, and incarnate. These are all the images of the European God. They were sculpted through the method and message of Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and Evangelical Protestantism. The encounter of the African in Antigua and Tobago with this European God was notably different. And here I come to Christianizing in Antigua, and Tobago. As early as 1637, there were Dutch Calvinists in Tobago and Coriander or Colander's ministers from the Duchy of Corlan. According to O'Neill, due to the frequent exchanges of colonial powers, a variety of religious persuasions came to Tobago as elements of colonization. Roman Catholicism could be traced to the early years of Tobago but did not have the widespread influence as it did in Trinidad. It later re-emerged during the 19th century and became an attraction to the Moravian followers who were leaving the Moravian church for an unconditional free church, according to one Moravian missionary. Anglicanism was present with the British and the first clergyman arrived in 1781 in Tobago. The Methodist work began in 1818. On the other hand, in Antigua, the Anglican Church had established five parishes by 1681. These were for the purpose of ecclesiastical development, but also for civil administration. The Anglican Church was the only church, except that it was for the whites. As Oliver Maynard noted, the churches were considered by the black population as bakra churches in which they had no part. 
Antigua, notably, was the home for the beginnings of Methodism in the Caribbean. And this was in 1788. Unlike Tobago, the Roman Catholics arrived in Antigua in the late 20th century. The first resident Roman Catholic priest came to Antigua in 1859, and the first Roman Catholic church was built in 1869. By the end of the 19th century, new movements, including evangelicals, holiness, and Pentecostal movements began to spread in the Caribbean. Afro-Caribbean religions were formalized by the 20th century. Just like the colonists, no Christian religion dominated Tobago religious landscape before the arrival of the Moravians. This is very significant. In contrast, Anglicanism was already ingrained in Antigua. So it was against the background of this Christian presence that the Moravians were pioneers among the black populations in Antigua and Tobago. The Moravian attention was drawn to the missionizing of the neglected black people in the Caribbean by an enslaved African, Anthony Ulrich. Generally, it was a mission lauded by its paradigmatic changes, but criticized for its paradoxical actions and inactions. The missionary Samuel Isles, who are worked in St. Thomas, Danish West Indies, arrived in Antigua in 1756. He lived in the cottage of an enslaved African before he was able to secure his own mission place. Al's personal contact with the enslaved Africans, however, gained only 34 converts by 1764. But with his missionizing strategy, which was different, among the people, steady growth ensued. If nothing else, the enslaved Africans began to trust the Moravians. So when Peter Brown arrived in 1772, he forged close bonds with the enslaved and the work expanded significantly. Brown visited, according to Maynard, the enslaved in the estates, he followed them in the hours of rest in the field, he ate with them out of their calabashes. He taught of the gospel to them. And with equal grace and wisdom, as a father with his children, drew their hearts to himself as a Negro's friend and a messenger of the church desires of their salvation. Numerical growth peaked in Antigua by emancipation. The Moravians accounted for 50% of the black population and the influence was even more widespread. In part, this may have attributed to Antigua being the only British colony which decided to forego the four-year period of apprenticeship. However, the irony is that the Moravian membership steadily declined in the post-emancipation period. The initial visit of the Moravian missionary brother John Montgomery to Tobago in 1787 was because of an appeal by an owner of an estate, John Hamilton, who lamented that the churches in Tobago were only for the colonists. With the support of the governor, Moravian work was started among the enslaved Africans. The exploratory visit by Montgomery generated much interest but there were no official members. In his diary, Montgomery wrote that while there was a large company of blacks who attended worship, many white people also attended. They were also curious. He further remarked that the enslaved attended the services more to please their masters than from an earnest desire to know what they should know to be saved. The enslaved, he observed, were not prepared to give up the Sunday market to attain services. Therefore, he remarked that there were a thousand in the market, but only one at church. 
The work in Tobago was aborted due to the political instability in Tobago. It was resumed in 1799, but was again stopped in 1802 due to the ill health of the missionaries and political upheaval. It was only in 1827 that there was a continuous Moravian presence in Tobago. This was just seven years before emancipation. However, unlike in Antigua, it took some time for the enslaved in Tobago to trust the missionaries. At Riceland, for example, the missionary wrote that the enslaved do not attain services because they don't want to go to the master's house. It is therefore not surprising that in 1834, there were only 800 Moravians who represented 10% of the black population. While membership declined in Antigua after emancipation, it increased in Tobago. So the Moravians in Antigua and Tobago. In Antigua and Tobago, most people of African descent were Christian, at least by baptism, by 1834. Members of the Moravian Church participated in Christian worship, rites, rituals, and sacraments. In the writings of the missionaries, the testimonials of the converted Africans were often tapered by doubts and uncertainties. Brother Clemens, in his report on Tobago in 1912, sums it up well when he wrote, The people have not forgotten that it was the Moravian Church which first brought them to Christ as a class. Despite all that might be said on the dark side, we should be ungrateful and untrue if we forget the scores near hundreds of truly converted souls whose quiet, consistent Christian living is a salt. A review of the reports of the missionaries in the Caribbean point clearly to the understanding that this dark side was not only the sins of the flesh, but anything that was identified as African in nature. My attention is now turned to Moravianism and its cultural purification. The Moravians, unlike other Christian missions in the Caribbean, did not advocate for the abolition of slavery. There was no theological, biblical, nor practical justification for the freedom of the enslaved population. As in the other mission fields in the Caribbean, the strategy of the Moravians in Antigua and Tobago was to create a separatist community of blacks that reflected the Christian and European values of the missionaries. There were three factors that were integral to Moravianism. The Moravian church was a German-centered church. Two, the theology was Christocentric. Three, the mission was pedagogical. German-centered. In the official newsletter of the Moravian Church East and West Indies, entitled Caribbean Calling, the Moravian Church was described as a German-centered church. A German-centered church. For over a century, the missions in the Caribbean were directly administered from Germany, although most missionaries were not German-born or did not come directly from Germany. In Tobago, for example, the role of missionaries to Tobago, 1790 to 1900, compiled by Theodore Clemens, showed that of the 45 brothers and 42 sisters who were missionaries, only seven male and six females were born in Germany. Similarly, in Antigua, of the 325 missionaries, there may have been no more than 20 German-born missionaries between 1756 
and 1941. However, the missionaries were equipped with instructions that guided the religious practices, management of the daily work and their daily lives. And these could all be traced to the meticulous leadership of Count Ludwig Zingzindov. Although the modus operandi of the Moravian missionaries evolved over the decades, it was very evident that the preservation of the Moravian observations and customs was central to the mission. For example, when Hernhut Day on June 17th was not celebrated in Tobago in 1905, the minister was not pleased and he thought that they were beginning to lose their attachment to Germany. In both islands, there was concerted effort to create the Gemeinde or Moravian village, which was a recreation of the German coherent spiritual community. Before emancipation, with the established plantation communities, this approach was relatively effective in Antigua. However, when the enslaved moved away from the plantations, they gradually disassociated themselves from the supervision of the Moravian church. On the other hand, in Tobago, while the plantation system was more restrictive during slavery, the formerly enslaved Africans established homogeneous free villages. These led themselves readily for the wholesale transferal of customs and practice of Moravianism. Politically, as a German center church, it was beneficial to the Moravians that Germany was not a colonizer before the 19th century when it had established colonies in Africa. The Moravian missionaries in the Caribbean were protected by the British 1749 Act of Parliament, but unlike the Methodists, the Moravians avoided conflict with the British colonists and the established church. Because of this, the Moravians were entrusted more with evangelizing and educating the enslaved. So the German-centered nature of the Moravian church was effective. The Christian message of the Moravians rooted in the Christocentric theology of Zinzendorf distinguished itself from the colonial Christianity that was hitherto presented. Zinzendorf introduced, as Pientrico summed up, a new paradigm to traditional German Protestantism, one that encouraged personal renewal and new birth, conventical gatherings for Bible study, and mutual encouragement, social activism, and post-millennialism and ecumenical cooperation. In contrast to the polemical Protestantism that gave rise to the 30 years war, end of quote. The Christocentric message inspired a worldwide mission that focused on the suffering of Christ. For blood and death are the diamond in the golden ring of the gospel was the message of the Moravians. The missionaries were warned to steer away from doctrinal questions and avoid theological debates. Our missionaries, according to the instructions, when they come among the heathen must first make it evident to the hearers that they acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Master, your God over all. The salvific work of Christ was a message presented to the black population. In his sole visit to the Caribbean, Zinzendorf made the appeal to the missionaries to bring freedom to the natural state which they have been born. The need for salvation from the inherent sinful characteristics of this slavery, the means by which they may be saved, and the political necessity of urging the slaves to remain the slaves faithful to their owner. The missionaries in Antigua and Tobago were truly clear that they were called to proclaim a gospel of Jesus Christ that redeems the soul. When Charles F. Shermer held his first service among the enslaved Africans in Tobago in 1799, 
he informed them that his mission was, quote, to make them acquainted with God, the creator and preserver, who alone could deliver them from the slavery of sin and Satan and translate them into the kingdom of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. The acceptance of the salvific message was born in the numerous testimonials including a Jacob in Antigua who said, Then the Savior come to me. Jacob loved the Savior and had been following the good Savior ever since. To communicate the gospel, Moravians had to teach the enslaved. While education was intended primarily to be a tool of evangelism, it became a means of empowerment. The mission was pedagogical. Mission Moravian schools were established to instruct in the rudiments of knowledge, teach basic skills, and instill discipline, as well as demonstrate good behavior. The restriction of the plantation did not permit formal education, but the Moravians used Sundays and Tuesdays as means of educating the enslaved population. The schools were extensions of the Sunday schools as means of educating the black population because the curriculum was similar. In Antigua, the first day school was at Graysel and it started in 1809. Sunday school was started a year later in 1810 at the Spring Gardens Church. And by 1838, there were over 3,100 students in the Moravian and day and Sunday schools in Antigua. Beyond elementary education, the Moravians initiated preparatory, secondary, teaching and theological education. Such pedagogical approach resulted in literate and numerate enslaved Africans, many of whom did not think of themselves as Moravians. In Tobago, when the Moravians resumed the work in 1827, there was formal teaching of the children on the Hamilton estate. It was in 1828 that a day school was started with 50 students. After emancipation, schools were established at all the plantations that the Moravians attended. Like Antigua, education went beyond Moravian membership. Many, many plantations requested the services of the Moravians in establishing schools. By the 1840s, there were 1,316 students in Tobago who attended the Moravian schools. Because of the success of this, the governor recommended that the Moravians introduce education to the rural schools because of the combination of instruction in menial tasks and reading and writing. Although the curriculum including, included writing, arithmetic, reading, and spelling, the missionary celebrated success in the knowledge of scripture. For example, the missionary Badham noted that as a whole, they were well versed, this is the black population, in scriptural subjects and often returned very correct answers to questions of doctrinal nature, referring to the plan of salvation. Higher school was proposed in 1844 for students who were 14 or 15. Unlike Antigua, this was not successfully pursued. In fact, the Moravians did not begin to train students in Tobago because as one missionary said, we do not wish to make teachers of our young lads and girls or to draw them away from the cultivation of soil. That honorable calling. By the 1860s, there were eight Moravian schools in Tobago. In 1907, schools, according to the missionary, were the mainspring of the mission. And in fact, the schools are the mission, he said. Close them, and you may as well abandon the whole work. The existence and continuance are bound up 
without the schools. So the Moravian church played an integral role in the education of the population. In the 20th century, governments assumed greater responsibilities for the schools, although they did not exclude the religious influence from the church. Despite this mission, which was most conducive to the work of the church, the Moravian missionaries in both Antigua and Tobago were not satisfied that the education served the intended purpose. In Tobago, the missionary noted that the rising generation misapplied the instruction and parents were cautioned in Antigua not to put extravagant notions in their children's heads, but to encourage them to live only to please God. The German-centered nature of Moravianism was used to chart new paths in evangelization among the enslaved populations. The Christological message of the Moravians bathed in the suffering of Jesus Christ resonated with them, and the pedagogical focus equipped and empowered communities. Through Moravianism, God was incarnate in Christ as the savior and educator. But this God was yet Eurocentric and not affirming in the sense of self of the Africans. Because of the ignorance, fear, and suspicion, the African culture was outlawed by the colonists, condemned by the established churches, and demonized by the evangelicals. The Moravians used the Eurocentric Christian message to de-Africanize or culturally purify the black population. African culture. Culture, the way of life of a people consists of the values, practices, and beliefs that are commonly held. Religion, argues Samuel Nathaniel Morrill, is one of the most important elements of Caribbean culture that links Car Afro-Caribbean people to the African past. Arguably then, the religious expressions from Africa, from the diverse ethnic and tribal groups, was not only a means of creating a new community, but the tool for survival of the hardships of the institution of slavery and the dehumanizing impact of colonialism. Although the numerical minority, the Europeans, according to W.A. Green, dominated all aspects of the Caribbean society, and they were able to preserve most of their own cultural and social institutions. But the Africans were not free to do so. The systematic deculturalization of the black population began with the introduction of slave codes or laws. In the 17th century, a court, in the 17th century, accordingly, according to the slave law, the black population was an hedonish, brutish, and uncertain, dangerous kind of people. The colonists then were to make it their duty to restrain the wanderings and meetings of Negroes and slaves at all times, more especially Saturday nights and Sundays and other holy days. Like the colonists, the clergy in the established religion, observed James Ramsey, denounced the African practices and largely disassociated themselves from the black population. Ramsey was, however, of the view that should the Anglican church follow the example of the Moravians, that they will find that they can improve the condition of the enslaved so that they will be more worthy and have more valuable subjection. To be sure, the Moravians had more intimate acquaintance with the practices of the enslaved, but this knowledge gained was not for the purpose of affirmation. Hence, the Moravians were instructed that if these customs are against the love of God and our neighbor, 
we ought not to excuse them on account of their being peculiar to that nation. The past, the Moravians were told, which was heard, seen, thought of, and transacted are evil and must be rooted out. Therefore, any convert who does not purify himself from such things is not faithful to the grace to which he is called. It has been argued by modern Moravian theologians that the mythological approach of Konzinsendorf is unique in that he believed that Christianity should be separated from European culture. Zinzendorf taught, according to this view, that they didn't, should not agree, sorry, Zinzendorf taught, according to this view, they not agree with teach, the teaching that European civilization before they could become Christian. Rather, Zinzendorf instructed that the Moravian missionaries, that they should live in the culture of the people. But culture was in this discourse limited to the learning of the language and living among the people. For the black populations in the Caribbean, reconciling the new Christian faith with the African past, cre past required the wearing of a mask. This phenomenon has been described by cultural and social theorist Stuart Hall as the perpetual struggle to connect the reality of their existence with imposed ideology. Cultural historians have well documented the diverse and complex evolution of the African practices that were retained in Antigua and Tobago. Essentially though, there were two central components of African culture. One, ancestral, ref ancestral reverence, and two, rhythmic celebrations. According to Murrell, ancestral reverence is the belief that human life continues beyond the dead. The dead communicate with the living and the living with the dead. Murrell explained that in the African culture, the ancestral spirits are consulted on every aspect through human medium for medicine, for luck, and are often associated with rituals of birth and death. The ancestral connection of worship in Tobago could be traced to the African traditional religion Yoruba, Orisha, and its leading divinity Shango, god of thunder and lightning. Obe was widely practiced. These African practices evolved into the synchristic spiritual Baptists, a combination of the American Baptists and the Orisha religion. This became dominant in Tobago. In Antigua, African ancestral connections were common and included belief in jumbies and spirits. And like Tobago, Obea was widely practiced as people sought to find answers. Antigua was not the birth to a syncretized African religion expression, although it was suggested that leaders left Antigua to begin such practices in Trinidad and Tobago. Similarly, the rhythmic celebrations were practiced both in Antigua and Tobago. The primary instrument was the drums, although other instruments were used. The beating of drums was accompanied by dancing, chanting, and was used for entertainment, meditation, and relaxation. However, according to Michael Roberts, Caribbean liturgist, it was this historical rhythmic expression that inspired a united community in the Caribbean. In both islands, the drums were often connected with revolts and rebellions. The frequency of such revolts in Tobago may lead one to conclude that the drums were more retained in Tobago than Antigua. For Christian missions, the drums conquered demonic spirits. In the Moravian mission, there was a fight for the soul 
but also a fight against the culture. In order to purify ancestral connections, the black population and Tobago was curiously described as a mission target by the Moravians. In Antigua, Mena noted that the enslaved population, though they practice and believe in obey, they needed the gospel so that they, become, they can become new men. Comparatively, he noted in Tobago that the missionary had his work cut out to teach the people that faith in Jesus Christ and worship of zombies could not go hand in hand. With the ancestral connections, while the ancestral connections were condemned in letters, diaries, and reports of the missionaries in both Antigua and Tobago, they were evidently so in Tobago more than in Antigua. This could have been attributed to the fact that the Tobagonians were longer without the influence of European Christianity and prolonged colonialism. And also because the Africans were still more African born than local born. And so in Tobago, the Moravians were more connected to their culture. In Tobago, the Moravians identified three cardinal sins as impurity, superstition, and strife. The lives of all, young and old, cursed and embittered by this evil, according to one missionary. From youth to old age, our people live in dreads of the unseen, fearing and fearing fear. Necromancy flourishes, which doctors abound. Obey men and women drive a flagging and lucrative trade. A gross darkness prevails, a darkness which all the preaching and teaching seem ineffective to move. This view was confirmed in the report by A.B. Romig in 1899. He wrote, the sins of the flesh are a great trouble in Tobago. Immorality and superstition are very rough. Missionaries were careful to write in detail their account of these superstitions. For example, on December 24, 1858, Zippel reported that a communicant member had brought to him a quantity of horse teeth, bones, and rusty nails, which had been extracted from her body by a black doctor or an Obe man. The doctor told the woman that her husband was the cause of her affliction. The result was that the woman left her husband to live with the black doctor. Missionaries also reported stories of members who would take earth from the ground and spread on the neighbor's house as a means of getting vengeance. Besides, the superstitions or the superstitious aspects of the ancestral expressions there were also medicinal knowledge, storytelling, rites of passage, attire, food, and habits that were associated with ancestral past. These were clearly linked to a dark past and replaced with Christian medicine, Christian rites, European attire, and European values. The missionaries, for example, boasted about the men neatly dressed in white drill or tweeted suits, the women dressed in gorgeous gown, behold in their bright colors, their gaily flowered hats, parasols, and high boots. The missionary reported there's plenty of swagger and style among the young people, the ribbons and the sashes. But it was the Christian rites, especially baptism, that were used to reshape the minds of the black population. The Moravians proceeded slowly and carefully to prepare the black population for baptism. Early baptisms, like the first woman in Antigua in 1757 and the Negro man in 1799, 
were close, given close attention by Moravia's instruction, these first views should be taken care of with the utmost attention and faithfulness. For if they should not prove an honor to our Savior and be not perceived that they are made new creatures after they have obtained the favor of baptism, it is natural for others to be induced to doubt the truth of what they are taught concerning baptism. Both baptism of adults and little children were supervised closely to ensure that no African element was evident in the black person. But the Moravians in Antigua and the Barbados encountered two major setbacks. First, there were too many illegitimate children which delayed and decreased baptism. In 1904, the missionary said, are we satisfied with the illegitimate birth rate of 60 to 70 percent in Tobago? Must we make up our minds always to have with us obey men or worse women as an essential feature of our social economy? This was frustration expressed by the lack of baptism. In Antigua, the numbers were similarly high, 50 percent illegitimate baptism. However, in Antigua, they continued to try to baptize by introducing newer clauses to accommodate the black population. Tobago parents began to choose other rites of initiation for their children. Fewer adults asked for baptism. The second problem was that the Moravians did not believe that the black population reflected the change and they expressed themselves in a civilized manner at India Walk in Tobago. The missionary Ricketer went to the plantation to baptize two white babies and was asked by several blacks for baptism. He refused to baptize them because he found them too ignorant to be admitted to this privilege. Like the birth initiation, the Moravians also attempted to shift the burial rites. There were burial grounds in both Antigua and Tobago. In Tobago, which have preserved the characteristics of the early Moravian church, and retain old practices and customs, categories of persons are buried separately. However, the Africans associated this with African practices. In Antigua, as Blair noted, the burials, the preparation of the burial ground, the beautification of the graves, the theme of the services, the tradition of calling the names of the, part, the departed, the circle of mourners made it easy for the slaves to superimpose their religion on this Christian worship. The Moravians believe that all ancestral connection was incompatible with Christianity. What they failed to understand was that this connection from African past was impossible. The denial of ancestral connections disassociated the Moravians from a sense of who they were. This was even more evident in the rhythmic celebrations. Ollendorp wrote, their dancing consists of jumping about, shaking their shoulders and moving their arms wherein the suppleness and strength of their bodies are displayed to good advantage. Even more monotonous in the, is the instrumental music to which they dance. A skin stretched over a small barrel or a calabash, or if need be, even a pot serves as a drum and animates their dancing, though it does not sound much better than someone pounding on a board. What Ollendorp observed as monotonous was one of the most powerful means of freedom, resistance, and connectivity for the black population. Dancing, chanting, and drumming were rituals that were central to ancestral worship, means of community celebrations for the black population. Mura noted the drums remain both a ritual conduit of the spirit and a main attraction 
for outsiders. African drumming in the Caribbean was a language that the black population understood. It transmitted messages to distant plantations. It unified the struggles of the diverse ethnic groups. It energized wearied bodies and rejuvenated stressed souls. As alluded to earlier, the fear of incited slave resistance and rebellion was the rationale for our lowing of the drums by the colonists. But the black populations continued the drumming and the accompanying activities in the face of punishment, exclusions, and even death. The Moravian missionaries believe that there was no good in these communal activities, but there were only opportunities for excess and profligacy. Exhortations and sermons warned that God would overthrow them like God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. The Moravians used two strategies to eliminate the rhythmic celebrations. They warned their followers to keep away from these community celebrations. And also, they taught European culture and music as a means of changing these African tastes. The Moravians abhorred the drumming on the estates. They reported of the enslaved who beat their drums or gibbets, they called them, and to engage in all the revelry and excesses of the most hedonish time. When the Africans danced or sang, it was considered to be most outrageous. In the diary of the first Moravian missionary trip to Tobago, Montgomery observed that they all ruined themselves in soul and body by the same sins and abominations that prevail in the other islands and their whole minds seem absorbed by them. However, even after a century of mission, J.E. Weiss said that in Tobago, the degrading and lowering powers of, powers of evil are ever present, warring against the higher and nobling influences which work for righteousness. But neither the adults nor the children refrain from attending community dances. The children in the Moravian schools were deemed to have gained head knowledge, but were described as wild, ignorant, debased, and with a kind of savage habit. The Moravians demonstrated sacred worship through solemn services. Drums were replaced by organs. Chanting were replaced by hymn singing. Dancing was replaced by quiet reverence. The litany in the Caribbean was identical to the litany in Europe. This provided a psychological bond between the missionaries and the worship community overseas, but was a counter to the African nature. Brother Wise observed in Tobago, at the beginning of the first service, it seemed to be very wild, but during the discourse, they were still. There was nothing to be perceived as an emotion. But both in Antigua and Tobago, after the solemn services, festivals, rites, and sacraments, the members had the African rhythmic celebrations. When baptisms were moved to Sunday mornings in Tobago, the missionaries lamented that the parents and sponsors used the remainder of the day for music and dancing. Eventually, they returned the baptism to Saturday morning, but this did not stop the celebrations after. And love feasts were often dreaded as they provoked celebrations that lasted throughout the night and attracted the entire community, both in Antigua but primarily in Tobago. European music that was introduced in the schools and churches in Antigua and Tobago were supposed to teach the black population 
to be Eurocentric in their worship. In Antigua, the wives of the missionaries taught musical instruments, and a rigorous program was done for the female teachers' college for the females to be organists and choir leaders. In Tobago, Moravian missionaries were pleased to report that the missionaries had a wide reputation as lovers of high-class music, and he commended them for their excellent congregation singing. Many came to Montgomery on the evening of the third to listen to Handel's rendering of Handel's Messiah. Christian rites and Christian worship were means of de-Africanizing the black population. As African identity and culture were affirmed, not only was African or were African expression celebrated in public festivals, but embraced in Christian churches. The reconciliation of African religious expression and rhythmic worship was led by the Afro-Caribbean religions and the new Pentecostal movements. The former facilitated a connectivity with the African past, while the latter spiritualized the rhythms. It is not surprising that the black people in Tobago found in the spiritual Baptist churches that became a welcome home. In Antigua, much to the disappointment of the Moravian missionaries, the Pentecostal churches gain membership from the churches. In conclusion, black people were imported, enslaved, emancipated, and became independent Afro-Caribbean people against a diverse but connected ancestral history. The black populations in Antigua and Tobago were seeking to etch out a way of life while maintaining a sense of who they are. The European colonists were interested in, the profiting, in profiting from the labor of the black population and cared little about their souls. However, they Christianized the colonies by introducing and upholding the practices of the European God. The Moravians, as the first evangelists to the black population, presented the incarnate God through the Christocentric message. By pursuing the impossible task of de-Africanizing the Africans, the Moravians did not affirm African cultural authenticity, and as a result, they left a legacy of doubt between Christianity and black identity. Thank you very much for listening.